He's been commended for his research commitment and leadership whilst developing services in Wales, particularly in MSK Ultrasound, and he continues to work as an anatomy trainer and teacher for the newly established National Imaging Academy Wales. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Peter Mullaney to give his talk on skeletal imaging in trauma. Right, well, thank you for such a, a wonderful introduction. I um, didn't realize I'd done so many cool things. Uh, I might just have to review my CV and uh, see where that actually takes me. But no, thank you for inviting me to talk today. It's a pleasure to be back at the uh, Society of uh, Radiologists in Training. I enjoyed very much the talk last year. The talk I've been asked to do this year is skeletal imaging and trauma. Now, this is quite a broad subject, and so there were many ways I could take this talk. And I have spent quite a long time wondering how best to do this. And to be honest with you, until about 10 minutes ago, I didn't really have a direction. Um, but what occurred to me this afternoon is that you've, uh, you're probably suffering a little bit from information overload. You've had some excellent talks from some very eminent uh, radiologists. Uh, and uh, you've had a nice lunch as well. So as your uh, mesenteric blood supply starts to dominate over your cerebral blood supply, I think we'll have a slightly more uh, light-hearted talk that's a bit lit bit less dense on the factoids, um, but will hopefully uh, generate some interest and highlight some interesting points in skeletal trauma because it's a very diverse subject uh, and it's um, very varied. So there's just a few hints and tips and sort of things that I've found over the years that are of use and certainly things that registrars have come up to me quite regularly over the years and asked about. So hopefully it'll be of some use and at least stimulate you to go off and do your own reading because as with all of these lectures, there's absolutely no way we can get you uh, up to speed on such broad subjects uh, with a half an hour talk. Okay, <clears throat> so when we talk about trauma, um, we have to recognise that it is actually one of the most important causes of mortality and morbidity worldwide. And unusually for some causes of morbidity and mortality, it's pretty much the same across the developed and the non-developed world. Okay? The facts here show how common it is, and it's the younger age groups, it's the people who potentially have the most to contribute to society, uh, economically and on a societal basis, who are the most affected. So it has a disproportionately high impact on the population makeup of a country. Okay, we can see that in the UK uh, there were 20, there are estimated about 20,000 cases of major trauma a year, of which 5,000 may die. Okay, and uh, well, up to 10% of the uh, uh, American population will suffer some form of traumatic injury uh, every year. You only have to look at YouTube to realise that that's clearly true. Okay, now what about trauma? It's expensive. Okay, when people suffer from trauma, because of the young age group, because of the potentially disabling and long term debilitating nature of the trauma, um, it costs money. How much money is very difficult to describe, but uh, uh, the Swiss, uh, with typical efficiency, did look into this retrospectively, and uh, they looked at a cohort uh, of patients who had undergone severe trauma, as defined by their injury severity scale score, and they followed them up over the next, uh, I think it was seven years, to sort of see where they were, and they found that trauma costs a lot of money. If you're disabled from the trauma that you have and have some long-term disability afterwards, you're looking at about one and a half million US dollars uh, per life. Okay, if, even if you're not permanently disabled, you're looking at sort of $150,000 uh, uh, treatment and rehabilitation, um, of which the initial imaging and treatment is a very small percentage of the costs. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the best form of trauma management is prevention. It also tells us that it is worth going to town on the immediately injured patient in terms of both imaging and treatment because A, you're going to get the best outcome for the patient, but B, you're going to get the best uh, economic impact in terms of the amount of money that you spend to help uh, the patient recover. Now, as we all know, trauma management is often defined in terms of the ATLS criteria, and we start with the ABC, where the management has got to be as definitive as possible within the golden hour post-trauma, okay? So getting your patient to a suitable centre and getting them seen by the right people is absolutely key. After the initial primary survey to make sure airway, breathing and circulation is intact, we go through a secondary survey to look at regional trauma and uh, potential uh, injury and disability. 
However, the clinical assessment in this scenario is unreliable and it's worse if your GCS is reduced either because of head injury or because of alcohol and drugs which are increasingly common in terms of trauma and polytrauma can mask some of the cardinal signs and symptoms that we usually rely on clinically for specific regional pathology. So multiple pathology can obfuscate the issue. Now, Given the fact that clinical diagnosis can be equivocal and therefore the reliance on imaging is going to be that much more uh, important, where do we fit into this? Well, if you're going to read something, I would recommend that you read the uh, College of Radiologists uh, publication on the recommendations uh, of standards for imaging of the severely injured patient. Okay, now it's in its second edition, it's a relatively recent revision, and this is quite a readable document, I say that advisedly for an RCR uh, document, on terms of the requirements that centres need to be able to manage trauma in terms of the equipment levels, where the equipment is in relation to where the primary survey is done and the patient is resuscitated, trauma team makeup and hierarchy, equipment levels, reporting times, staffing requirements, etc. Okay, it's, it's worth reading. Um, we in Cardiff are contending with becoming the major trauma centre for uh, certainly South Wales, if not the whole of Wales, and we're looking at some of these requirements in disbelief as we clearly are not going to get up to scratch without a significant cash injection. And this is providing the basis for which we can make our business case. So by and large, a typical protocol will uh, involve a primary survey, which will be clinically done in the ER. Now, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable or there is some obvious trauma that is going to be an immediate threat to life and limb, they may go straight to the intervention suite or uh, to uh, theatre for immediate management. Now, what we hope is that the patient is more stable than that. Okay? Now, depending on how severe the trauma is perceived as having been had by the patient, you might get away with focused uh, radiography and ultrasound of specific regions. I won't be talking much about FAST, which is focused assessment of sonography and trauma, um, because it's mainly to do with the soft tissues, which are a bit of an inconvenience for a bone radiologist like me, uh, and also uh, that's quite a controversial subject in its own right. What is increasingly happening is that if a patient has been perceived to have had major trauma, you'll go straight to CT, um, probably after the secondary survey. Now. If you're going to go to CT, don't faff around with FAST, don't faff around with radiography, worry about that afterwards, get the patient to the CT scanner as quickly as possible. That's the way you're going to save lives. Now, is CT more important than secondary survey or is it done afterwards? That's a moot point. I think increasingly people are probably shoved straight through the scanner as quickly as possible and the secondary survey can be considered a clinical afterthought once the imaging is up. I don't denigrate the clinical survey, I just think that MDCT has become very, very important and increasingly appreciated as such over even the past sort of eight or nine years. Okay. This is some guidelines um, from the Multidisciplinary Task Force for Advanced Bleeding Care in Trauma. Okay, now they're a, a, a big body. These were their initial guidelines in 2007. I actually did a talk on major trauma in 2009, so this was quite current. There have been four revisions since then, the most uh, recent in 2016. You can see where, uh, let me try with a laser pointer, you can see where imaging was placed here um, in the uh, sort of protocol. And there's a lot of talk about sonography. So this is when FAST was quite fashionable for uh, interested radiologists and for ER technicians. Interestingly now, this is the most recent revision from 2016, the talk about imaging, although its actual uh, place has not uh, changed, there's very much more emphasis on MDCT. Start with the best test and start with it quickly. You'll get the best diagnosis as quickly as possible. How do we do CT? Well, most people follow the Bastion Protocol, <clears throat> okay, um, which was formulated, obviously, for uh, uh, war and militarily injured patients. Okay, so first there's a non-contrast enhanced CT scan of the head and neck, this is what we follow anyway in Cardiff, and then you do a biphasic contrast injection, which um, uh, is still going when the patient is scanned. And what this does, this allows excellent both arterial phase and portal venous phase of pacification of blood vessels, so it'll highlight bleeding from both sort of areas, and it's the venous bleeding that can sometimes be the most insidious and the most concerning for a surgeon. Um, Studies have shown as well that you get the best scan for less radiation dose than multi-pass CT scans, which used to be the norm. Okay. Right, come on, go down, go down. 
There we go. Does early CT imaging help? Well, let me just say yes, okay? It has been shown in a lovely study in 2009 in, published in The Lancet, which I do encourage you all to read, but it is the basis of the RCR guidelines, as well as a lot of seminal works in trauma and the management thereof. A retrospective multi-center study uh, across Europe uh, with nearly 5,000 patients showed, in a nutshell, that CT is itself an independent prognostic indicator um, regardless of what has happened to the patient and where they are treated. In other words, if any one of us here in this room today undergoes major trauma, our chances of survival are significantly increased just by having a CT. Now, that's very simplistic, obviously. It's not just having a CT. It's the fact that you are alerted early and accurately to pathology that might otherwise grumble on and affect uh, the way you respond to trauma. But basically, in a nutshell, if someone's had severe uh, injury, get them an early CT. Even if you are more severely injured than someone who hasn't had a CT, you are likely to do better. Okay, so this is a very useful uh, study. Having established that CT is the way forward, Where does skeletal trauma fit in this? Well, in a retrospective review of nearly 800 cases in Leeds, they showed that uh, skeletal trauma in the multiply injured patient um, is, uh, has about 31% incidence, and this is major injury, of which spinal injuries, pelvis and hip fractures, and long bone fractures are the uh, main culprits. And um, the etiology of the trauma also is significant. Now, pedestrian versus vessel, as you can imagine, has the most uh, uh, incidence of uh, trauma, uh, bony trauma, but motorcycle accidents are right up there as well. Falls coming a bit of a uh, poor third, and assault uh, only about 2% of the time. And by and large, unless someone's really going to town on you, uh, the assault, it's not going to be necessarily life-threatening bony injuries, but it is going to be significant trauma. So having talked about the role of imaging in trauma management and the rationale for why it is important, let's talk about some sort of scenarios. This is sort of more fact-based sort of stuff, and then we'll go into some case studies later. But pelvic fractures are possibly the most significant form of musculoskeletal trauma a person can undergo, and therefore for musculoskeletal radiologists, possibly some of the most important things we should be aware of. Okay? Although relatively rare, they are potentially devastating injuries, okay, they're often associated with an extremely high injury severity score. Bear in mind that although the injury severity score goes up to 70, when you get an injury severity score of about 12 to 13, you have undergone major trauma. So if someone's got an ISS of 25 to 48, as is uh, referenced here, you are a very sick person indeed. The mortality rate for pelvic injury still remains very high, 10 to 16, up to 20%, Although having said that, in the 70s it used to be 50%, so the mortality has come down significantly over the past 20 to 30 years, and that is mostly because of improvements in things like interventional radiology uh, as well as surgical technique. And I'm sure diagnostic radiology has a big role to play in terms of managing the patient better and quicker than uh, previous techniques would have allowed. In terms of adults, uh, we, at the bottom now we've got some associated injuries. So if someone's got a pelvic fracture, you should immediately be looking for chest trauma, head injuries, long bone fractures, that's a no-brainer. Obviously the femora are quite close to the pelvis. If the pelvis has been mullered, it's very likely that the, uh, the, the femora have been uh, damaged as well, but also the tibia and fibula, and that goes again with the mechanism of injury. Then solid organ injury is quite high. Now, I did some work on my fellowship on uh, pelvic fractures in paediatric population at the Sick Kids in Toronto and this was uh, a review I did uh, and this is a bunch of series of associated injuries with pelvic uh, trauma in the paediatric population. As you can see, the overall numbers for significant injury in other organ systems are very high and the mortality rate is therefore also very high. So these are injuries that need to be taken seriously and need to be managed very aggressively. Okay, now here we've got a patient, I've got some case studies now and hopefully this will let me do, I don't know how this is going to, will it let me do it? Yep, okay good, they're coming through. Right, so we've got some coronal reformats and then some axial things, sorry they shouldn't be going at the same time, just showing a patient who'd undergone uh, an RTC, the, the car rolled over, which is a poor uh, uh, indicator uh, of major trauma um, in, uh, clinically, and what we can see is that this guy 
managed to dislocate his right hip. Interestingly, anteriorly, usually it's posterior dislocations, but somehow the, the hip managed to come out from the front. And uh, this is just a, 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 an edited sequence, just showing the nature of his injuries. He's got some fracture transverse processes there. That right sacroiliac joint has been sprung. I think we can see that quite clearly. And as we go further down, there's the anterior right hip dislocation and some pubic rami fractures, as well as possible disruption of the pubic symphysis. Uh, very, very ill indeed. OK. Here's an even worse case. Now, let me just try and do this one first. Yep, here we go. So let's just toss up the injuries. Right clavicle, left humerus, bilateral ribs most obviously on the left, right pneumothorax, okay. We go down further, bunch of soft tissue stuff, as I say, an academic annoyance for us bone radiologists. And then we get to the really interesting stuff in the pelvis and fractures there of the left sacral ala. And my goodness, look at that symphysis pubis. This is one of the most eye-watering CTs you can see. If we go on to the coronal to have a look at that pelvis in a bit more detail, is it going to let me? Yes, good. Um, I almost thought this was a vertical shear injury uh, at first, but obviously this patient was a cyclist versus car. Now, the reason I showed you the Burgess and Young classification, albeit quickly in one of my previous slides, is it's a very nice mechanistic description of the way pelvic injury can reflect the sort of trauma that they've had. You can tell from this fracture pattern on these images particularly that this guy wasn't just knocked off his bike, he was run over, okay? And the wheels went over his lower thorax and punctured his lungs and, uh, and fractured his ribs and then totally cleaned out his pelvis. And his pelvis was probably crushed in all sorts of ways. And the thing is, it can sometimes spring back to a pretty normal geometry and morphology. And so you will underestimate the degree of injury that this patient has had um, on the basis of the imaging alone. This is why you need to understand mechanisms of injury and equate that to the pathology uh, and anatomy of uh, the bony system that we're looking at. Okay, so this was a very, very ill person indeed. Now, come on. Hang on a second. There we go. Here's someone who isn't perhaps quite so seriously injured, but what this shows is the value of uh, radiography as well. Okay, radiography is not dead for a couple of reasons. Okay. It's fast and it's quick, and in someone who's severely injured but hasn't perhaps got to CT yet, it's a good way of diagnosing limb or potentially life-threatening injuries. Limb injuries perhaps more than anything else. So we can see on the um, radiograph that this person's got a nasty posterior hip dislocation on the right. Okay. Now when we go through the CT, we are going to see that in more detail because the, the surgeon needs detail when they're sort of working out how they're going to manage this patient. But you can see from this that this is a post-reduction CT. So when you get a radiograph like this, which is the first investigation you'll get in the, DR, in the ER, you're not going to let them go around with a, fra with a dislocated hip like this. Your immediate response is to reduce it. Okay? Then you can start worrying about the uh, other bits and bobs with CT later. So the thing about radiography is sometimes it may be the only documentation of the sort of injury that the patient has had before immediate limb-saving uh, uh, intervention has been performed. And limb-saving because of the vascular compromise uh, of the displacement of this, of this. So let's get this down. And there we go. Now, this patient I reported on today. Okay, this is a chap who had a head-on collision RTA. Okay, now he had a bastion protocol, but I've sort of edited it just to show the nature of uh, this guy's complex posterior left hip, his clutch foot, left hip dislocation, okay, with comminution of the posterior wall and column and fractures around the ischial tuberosity. But CT doesn't answer the whole questions, okay? Clinically, this patient had a nasty left leg injury, and radiographs taken at the same time showed a comminuted open fracture of the patella, okay, and if it lets me, come on, come on, come on, there we go, a fracture of the ulna as well. Now, um, I have a feeling this chap was actually ejected from his car by the nature of these injuries. You don't get quite all of these injuries. We can in cars, depending on what sort of car they've got, but certainly your chance of severe trauma go up if you're ejected, and your mortality used to go, uh, it used to be quoted, went up about six times more likely if you were ejected from a car. It may have changed nowadays. Anyway, there we go, there's his uh, CT. Now, knowing that his knee was stuffed, he got a CT of that knee 
after the fact, okay, this is not a life-threatening thing, but it's obviously going to need to be assessed. And the CT shows the nature of the comminuted fracture of the patella serial period pole and confirms all the soft tissue gaps, confirming that this is an open injury, which of course is going to be managed completely differently to an otherwise closed injury of the, of the leg, um, and so will require uh, different management and therapeutic protocols. Okay, so we have a dialogue here between CT and radiography and CT again. Um, in order to get the best uh, for the patient. Um, he had his fractured uh, hip reduced, and you can see that they had a post-reduction uh, radiograph uh, in the emergency room. His blood is still full of the contrast that was pumped through him for his CT. And uh, then he had a post-reduction CT, which we just saw there very quickly. Okay, I'm whizzing through this a little bit there. Okay. So again, DR and CT uh, work in conjunction to get the information that we need to help the patient and assess their treatment response. Okay, here um, is again the post-reduction DR and CT showing the nature of that although we've reduced this hip fracture, he's still got a significant acetabular injury. Now the Burgess and Young classification of pelvic trauma does not include the acetabulum. That is a separate area that has its own classification system. Now, the thing about trauma for you guys is that you need to be conversant with some of the more popular classification systems for various regional parts of skeletal trauma. So Burgess and Young is a good one, I think, for the pelvis, although it's not the one that's necessarily used by orthopods. It's this mechanistic um, uh, slant in the way things are achieved will allow you to have a, a more informed and clearer dialogue with your, with your surgeons and your clinicians when the polytraumatized patient comes in uh, through the door. Okay. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. A significant proportion of pelvic trauma can be seen in kids and it's often avulsion injuries. Now, these are not life-threatening. These are not necessarily particularly serious, but they're very painful for the patient and often require um, hospitalization for pain relief. And until you actually know that it's something as simple as an avulsion injury, which of course we can see uh, here, um, the patient, um, uh, the clinician doesn't know uh, how serious their injury is. And it's interesting that this often happens in athletic young uh, patients who may have a good sporting career ahead of them, but this will influence or affect their sporting career going forward for life. And up to 17% can never achieve the same degree of athletic performance pre-injury. Let's quickly talk about spine injuries. And again, this is a huge subject, so I've taken a very subjective view and uh, we're just having a little bit of a sampler here. Okay, eight minutes left, let's hurry up. Alrighty, so traumatic spine injury. Okay, so I'm talking mainly about the thoracic and lumbar spine. And it's where the spine goes from a relatively fixed component to a relatively mobile component and vice versa. So it's at the junctions, okay? So T11 to L2, thoracic spine, it gets injured a lot simply by virtue of how people are um, injured. So RTAs with steering wheel column injuries, um, the way people are cleaned out if they're run over and so on. Typically enough, it affects males more than females and there is a high incidence of neurological deficit which of course has devastating life-long uh, consequences. Here we've got a young 32-year-old uh, male, younger than me anyway, who fell 10 metres uh, and has sustained what you can clearly see is a burst fracture of T12. Now I've got these uh, sagittal reconstructions. These are all obviously highly edited just to show sort of the relevant pathology. If I can stop it there, yeah. There we go, you can see the burst fracture. Now a lot of people do talk about how well the spinal canal is narrowed in terms of burst injuries, okay? And they might say, well, there's 40% narrowing of the spinal canal, okay? Dynamic studies on pig models, I don't know how they did this, where they imaged pig spines as they were subjecting these poor porkers to all sorts of horrific trauma, show that it doesn't matter how narrow the spinal canal looks on the CT after the fact. At the time of trauma, when that burst fracture occurs, that posterior spinal fragment that we saw there actually goes right the way back into the spinal canal. It bounces off the internal surface of the spinal lamina and then goes back, it rebounds back into the vertebral body. So it doesn't matter how narrow do you think the spinal canal is now, you can pretty much guarantee that at the time of trauma that spinal canal was completely obliterated, at least transiently. And this is why the risk of spinal injury is high. And here we've got the MRI of this character. 
here, which shows the T12 fracture, and it shows high signal within the spinal cord um, because of uh, the initial injury. Now, um, if it's high just on T2-weighted imaging, it's more likely to be edema, in which case they might have a better prognosis because once the edema settles, neurological function may improve. If it's high also on T1, and, you're wor and it might be because of a little bit of blood or methemoglobin in the spinal canal, then the prognosis might be worse because when you've got frank blood in the spinal cord, the injury is greater and the long-term outcome tends to be poorer. Okay? Um, the king, if you will, the royal flush of spinal injuries perhaps is the chance injury. Now this is a hyperflexion injury over a seat belt and um, can often be through the uh, soft tissues. Uh, rather than the bone. And here we can see that on this injury, um, it's actually gone through the disc at the disc and plate interface before coming up through the spine there. And uh, here's the MR of this patient, and this guy's completely transected his cord. Okay? This guy's going to be paraplegic for life now. Okay? An absolutely horrific injury to see. Okay? Just to show going further, here is the axial T2 scans of the spinal canal and just watch the way the spinal canal reconstitutes at a completely different place as we go down through the spine where you lost it in all the hematoma and displacement initially and then there's again the sagittal view just to sort of show it. So these are horrific, horrific injuries. Okay? Quick talk about facet dislocation, which is obviously referring to the cervical spine. Okay? Unilateral versus bilateral, we're going to make this quick because you should know this already. Okay? So unifacet dislocation, you'll see one of the facets is dislocated, then the contralateral facet should still be congruent, and typically the amount of anterior displacement of one vertebral body on the other is about 25%, it's certainly less than 50%, okay? Um, these are all the signs you can tend to see, okay? Bifacet dislocation is at least as common as unifacet and can sometimes be more subtle on radiography, especially on the AP views, because unifacet dislocation often gives you a rotational component, whereas a bifacet might be symmetric enough that there's no rotation, so one of the cardinal signs of injury may be missing. A quick caveat, a lot of these injuries are often at the C6, C7, T1 interface, so we do insist on seeing C7, T1 for a reason on any imaging that we do. Okay, so make sure, otherwise you could be missing up to 17% of injuries. Okay, um, there's some more CT for bifacet uh, fracture dislocation and some uh, uh, anterior displacement there. Here's the MRI of the same patient showing cord injury. Now in the cervical spine, the spinal canal is slightly wider than in the lumbar uh, spine, so your chances of cord injury go down slightly, but this guy's displaced enough that it's still managed to prang the cord. Okay, so again, uh, a much more guarded prognosis. Here's an interesting one, bifacet fracture dislocation from a rugby injury, would you believe? <clears throat> and one of the complications can be if the fracture goes through the uh, foramen transversarium, you can get vertebral artery injury, okay? We had a patient uh, some years ago who suffered, it was actually a unifacet fracture dislocation, it's a different case. Uh, they uh, had it diagnosed on CT, they had an MR to show neurological injury, but what the MR wasn't, didn't, um, or wasn't reported on was the fact that it was abnormal high signal within the vertebral artery because the flow void was missing, because they had intimal damage and clot, and in actual fact they stroked out and died as a result of this. So this was a, it's, it's a very difficult thing to diagnose, but it, I would advise you to look at the vertebral arteries very closely in whatever modality imaging you're using in order to try and avoid that complication. Okay. Right, I have two minutes, so let's quickly skip through some others. Hmm. Okay, here we've got some radiographs of a, of a 70 year old lady who just had a stumble in the street. Now, these things are very common. Radiographs show that there's an effusion and some background osteoarthritis. It's a bit difficult to see any other pathology, so we actually uh, were asked to do a CT. What the CT shows is that she's got a comminuted but undisplaced fracture of the tibial spine complex. Now, this is great, this is a win. You put this patient in a long leg cast. Uh, for a few weeks, providing those fractures don't displace, they will heal back down and she will be left with a fully functional knee with an intact ACL complex. Okay, So this is where CT and DR have complemented definitive management in this patient. Another quick one, paediatric elbow. Everyone talks about Crytol and everyone gets stressed out. Okay, I try not to get stressed out about Crytol um, and I'll give you the reasons why. It's very difficult to remember the ages that these various ossification centres um, 
ossifying. <coughs> error bars are wide, and I think they've changed as nutrition over the past 50 years has improved in kids. So uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 is a nice simple one that I like to learn. The thing you've got to remember, and which is vitally important, is the fact that the internal epicondyle ossifies before the trochlea. Here we've got a paediatric patient with, a, with an ossified internal epicondyle, but the trochlea is currently still all cartilage. And then someone slightly older, where we can see the trochlea now, but we can also see the internal epicondyle, and that is where it belongs, and it's starting to fuse. Why is this important? Well, kids avulse their internal epicondyles quite easily, okay? And what we've got here, we've got a young kid who had trauma. You can see the soft tissue swelling. We can see ossification in the trochlea, so we should have ossification of the internal epicondyle, but where the internal epicondyle belongs is absent, okay? And what it's done is it's been flipped out. Now, luckily enough, this kid managed to flip it out into the subcutaneous tissues. No big deal. It could be managed fairly easily, possibly even operatively. But you get a problem where um, paediatric kids dislocate their elbows. And here we can see a kid who's dislocated his elbow after a fall. And you can see that posterior <coughs> chunk in the bone there, which is tempting to call a capitella fragment. And in the adult, it often is. But it's not. I think what we can see here is we can see that the trochlea is ossified there, but we're not seeing the internal epicondyle at all, okay? Now, if you reduce a, a dislocated elbow in a paediatric case and they've done this internal epicondyle avulsion injury and it's not recognised, when you reduce the elbow, that chunk can go into the joint and that is a very expensive medico-legal payoff um, for the patient and very uh, damaging for the trust because it is recognised that you have to be careful of this internal epicondyle and make sure that it doesn't get stuck in the joint when you reduce the elbow. Happily, the clinician in charge of this patient's care was switched on. They went to theatre, they reduced the dislocation and you can see the internal epicondyle is now back where it belongs, okay? And then we've got some proper post... Um, uh, uh, um, reduction radiography in a cast and this patient's going to do all right okay as far as you can do let's just quickly go on for some more we'll ignore that we'll ignore that because I'll give you my favorite case at the end just to show you that people do not learn okay now <clears throat> You'll notice that when I've been going through these pictures, I've even got rid of the date, so there's no way people can identify things, but I want you to see the date on this particular character. So he pitched up in 2008, uh, and when I see young men who have injured themselves severely after a, a long fall, and they're not builders, I tend to assume, perhaps unfairly, that they're escaping from the rosers, okay? So this chap managed to fracture his right calcaneum uh, falling for whatever reason, okay, not judging. And here's the CT showing the degree of depression and comminution of the fracture, okay? Now, in my book, that's a good enough injury for any lifetime. But no. 2011, he comes back again. Again, a fall. Goodness knows what he was doing. Maybe he was heavier than normal because he had a TV on his back. That's speculation, <laughs> okay? But there you go. You can see the fact that his ankle is completely rogered. Now, this is what we call a pilon fracture, and there is a classification system called the rene Algauer system, which is one I've tended to use in the past. But I'll give you a tip. Don't bother remembering it, because the only time I've ever seen pilon fractures, they've always been the worst that the rene Algauer system can actually diagnose. So basically, you go from a normal ankle to one that's completely Donald Duck, for want of a better term. Okay, we've got the CTs uh, of the case here. Let's just get those up. So sagittal and coronal scans showing this the degree of complete stuffing of this, which was previously his good ankle. Okay, so now this poor soul has two desperately damaged osteoarthritic ankles and feet. But no, there's more. <laughs> just give me a second. Come on through. He comes back in 2015 with a fractured left zygoma. Now, why was that? I don't want to speculate on what happened, but clearly this dude isn't learning to avoid trouble. And presumably he got a fractured zygoma because he couldn't run away because his legs weren't working very well. <laughs> so every now and then a trauma story, uh, a trauma patient does tell you a nice story. So what have we learned? Very quickly now. Trauma is common, it's expensive and devastating both for patients and for the country in which it occurs. Imaging has a key role and is increasingly important, but don't just rely on one um, modality. Multi-modality imaging will get the best out of the department for the patient's benefit, and sometimes the multi-modality imaging has to be a dialogue over time, not just looking for acute trauma and acute complications, but then long-term complications as well. 
Some patients may represent, so looking at previous imaging is absolutely key. And do try to be conversant with some uh, of the more common classification systems. If not because they're used locally, at least you can have an intelligent dialogue with your clinicians and which will better facilitate the patient's management. Thank you very much.